Speaking things, um, I put out the first homework. It's on D2L, and uh, we'll assign it Wednesday. I won't be here. Derek will be teaching on Wednesday, um, and we'll make it two weeks. So it'll be two weeks from Wednesday. I think that turns out to be February 8th. Again, I won't be here, so Derek will be teaching. <laughs> I'm hoping I will be at a meeting in New Orleans, but we'll see. Okay, um, yeah, and as it said in the initial outline, um, I want you all to do individual work. I don't mind if you guys talk over some real naughty problems that is bothering you, but um, otherwise, um, expect a paper from each of you. It's our only, it's the only thing that's marked in this class, so. <coughs> Okay, um, trying to pick up where we left off. So this business of expected value, or we give you some other terms, expectation value, although I don't think I've ever heard of it, mathematical expectation. This is really um, <clears throat> meaning the mean or, or the long-term value. When we talk about variance, it would be the long term averaged over a lot of different realizations. <clears throat> so um, we're going to talk about what it means to repeat things. It's going to be part of the subject today. So you could have a, <clears throat> a weighted sum, but largely you won't. But if you do, I mean, depends on the problem. <clears throat> so, um, the expected value shouldn't be confused with the most probable value. That's not necessarily uh, the one that is most likely to occur, but it's generally the long-term lean. So, um, when the sample size gets really big, all of those things don't have a lot of difference. When the sample size is relatively small, Remember I told you, what was the magic number? 30. And I can't tell you where that came from. <laughs> it's in a lot of books and, and papers and stuff that you'll read. But I don't know who first came up with 30. <clears throat> so the expected value is, again, this integral. And um, just keep thinking it's a, <clears throat> a long-term thing. So we've talked about probability density functions. Some people just call that the density of the <clears throat> distribution. Um, some people call it a probability distribution function. Some people, so only, why am I doing this? I'm doing this because people are not consistent. So I don't want you to go out there and say, oh, well, it has to be this. Somebody's calling it something else. They're going to do that. They get really sloppy about it. And so people do not, there's not a strict guideline. You're not, you're, you're not terminated if you don't say the right thing. <coughs> we had that already. And <coughs> um, this is just the expected value for the variance is it the <coughs> long-term mean of that square. I already showed you this. This is in the textbook, all, all of the versions. There are relationships for calculating expected values. <clears throat> and uh, they're not exactly the same. We're going to talk much later, well, not much later in this class, but later in this class, the covariance is going to become a very important element that we're going to use. Covariance is, is very important. And the covariance is basically just the product of two things, okay? But <clears throat> here, the expected value of the covariance would be over a, a long, <coughs> large um, representation. Has anybody heard of an ensemble? What's an ensemble? Anybody want to tell me what an ensemble is? Nobody knows. 
So, so I, I warned Derek. I said, these guys don't talk up. So after he came last time, he says, you're right, they don't. <laughs> so the, you should not be afraid to talk up. That's not, not a problem. I mean, if you, get, if you get it right, great. If you get it wrong, that's great, too. We'll talk about it. We'll try to figure out what it means. So nobody knows what an ensemble is? OK, an ensemble is an idealization. It's a collection, number of, <coughs> of copies. An ensemble really says that if you wanted to do your statistics properly, each sample would have to come from a separate little universe, OK? Each time you take a measurement came from a whole different universe. All the things in the universe are different. Doesn't happen, right? So what do we do? Um, well, we're going to talk about <coughs> what we have to do instead. Um, there's a thing called representativeness. It is a word. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about how ensembles are made. Has anybody heard about the ergodic hypothesis? Anybody heard about the ergodic hypothesis? Okay, the ergodic hypothesis says, okay, we can't do ensembles. We really can't do the exact definition of an ensemble. Won't. We, we don't have the capability. So what, what we're going to do is we're going to use time or space averages. So we're going to represent ensembles by different things in time or different things in space. That's kind of what we can do. And the ergodic hypothesis says that's OK. That's what you can do. That's the hypothesis says that's how you're going to make ensembles. So this is the only time we're going to talk about it. But hopefully you walk away and realizing that there is this thing called the ergodic hypothesis that says, OK, it's all right to work in time or in space because you can't do ensembles. But if you really did the mathematics correctly, you would have ensembles. Okay, it's an idealization. It's it's something works really great in pure mathematics, but we're not going to live in pure mathematics. We're going to go out and work in real data, and when we work with real data, we have to use this thing because we are limited to our ability to use different <coughs> data. Okay, um, so. We can calculate things in time. You do time averages. We can calculate things. I keep saying this space idea because so often we fall into just talking about time, where space is, is another equivalent domain. The bias of an estimator, we're going to talk about estimation the whole next section in 1.2 talks about estimation theory. What we really do, no matter what you do, you estimate the true thing. You know, I, I know you don't think about it because you take a measurement and you, know, you write down the numbers and that's what the number is, but you never really do know exactly what the right answer should be. It's out there somewhere. So you're doing a statistical estimator. So this is the bias of an estimator. So in here, the estimator is a squiggle. Sometimes it's a hat. You, you look for some kind of symbol to, de, to designate it. So the bias is you know, the <coughs> estimator. The brackets, OK, those triangular brackets, that means expected value. Okay, when you see that, that's expected value. So that's the expected value of the estimator minus the true value, which you don't know. 
Okay, <clears throat> so you can expand this and if you have a bias that's equal to zero, it's an unbiased estimator, which is a very attractive property. You'd like it to be an unbiased estimator. <clears throat> um, so this is the expected value for X bar, the mean. And <clears throat> this just shows you again, remember we showed you could expand it and have a formula where you needed only one pass and not two, where you didn't have to go calculate. That's the, this is the same thing, only expressed as expected value. Okay, we're gonna, this is just a quick run through of probability density functions. The ones that we work with are pretty well known. So a random variable has n possible values that are equally probable, then it has a discrete uniform distribution function. So what's the uniform distribution function look like? That's it, yep. Flat. <clears throat> Everybody has exactly the same probability. No difference. <clears throat> so this is a discrete uniform. What's the difference between a discrete uniform and any other kind of uniform? <laughs> You're making the motions back there. <laughs> You're getting it down, yeah. The specific number of uh, individual parts instead of the individual. Exactly. Right, they're discrete numbers rather than a line. Un <coughs> normally uniform distribution, uh, uniform distribu we're gonna see that next. So if we, Remember, what's the difference between the distribution and cumulative? Cumulative is the integral. So if you integrate this thing on the left, you get this thing on the right. And <clears throat> this is, these are, oh, why did it do that? These are the properties of this discrete uniform population. You can look all that stuff up. Now this is a continuous uniform population. So you write it this way. It's a value and then zero. It looks like this. And this time when you integrate it, you get a straight line. Okay, this is our friend, the uh, uniform distribution that we're gonna use a lot. And um, this is the uh, probability density function. And uh, this is, um, why does the uniform show up again? Okay, <clears throat> this is the binomial distribution. So what's the binomial? What? There's only two outcomes, yeah. So binomial says that it can only be heads or tails, white or black, whatever. It's not a whole bunch of numbers. Can't be a lot of numbers. It can only be two things. This is the expression for the probability for a binomial distribution. This is a probability density function. And notice the density function changes with the probability of an outcome. Okay, so this is <clears throat> for the binomial. You can look this stuff up. This is just in here for completeness. Here's our friend, the normal distribution, <clears throat> also called the Gaussian distribution. But note again, Gauss was not the first guy to work with this. Remember, it goes back to this Demov guy 100 years earlier. <clears throat> Anyway, the normal distribution turns out to be really useful, and we're going to talk about that right in a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> it gives us information about not only the mean, but about the distribution of values around the mean. And we're going to talk about a thing called the standard normal, which is actually a tabularized version that you can use to um, do a lot of calculations. 
So these are all different Gaussians. They have <coughs> different standard deviations. This one has a different mean. Those are the two parameters that dictate a Gaussian mean and the standard deviation. And you saw this earlier. This is my favorite diagram. Within one sigma, you have 68.3%. Within two sigma, you got 95.4%. And three sigma, you got 99.7. So <clears throat> that's the way things are distributed. This is the formula. I don't know how they ever did that. I, I still don't. I mean, whenever those old scientists came up with these kinds of formulas, I don't know how they did that just total mystifies me. <clears throat> so these are just another expression and like I said this just shows you the different standard deviation. Now this is the Z distribution. This is the standard normal distribution. Okay, standard normal is a way of parameterizing the normal distribution so that you can put it in a table and then you can look up things. Okay, it has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So that's what standardized it. So <clears throat> um, this is a, the simplified version with those, those assumptions. And this is, again, another plot. I don't know why I have so many plots in here. Okay, um, now we're going to come back to that, how to use that standard normal table. So this is just telling you that it, it exists. There's a thing called the F distribution, and we're going to introduce it for um, hypothesis testing. This funny looking thing here is the gamma function, and we're really going to use one of the gamma functions a lot. Um, <clears throat> So we're going to talk later about a student T distribution. Anybody know what that is? What's a student T distribution? And how did it get that stupid name? Anybody know? Student T distribution is a version of the normal that works better for small populations. OK? And it was developed by a guy in a class, and he was afraid to put his name on it. So he submitted it with the name Student T. And it's been called Student T ever since, which is kind of weird, but that's the way it worked. Here's the F distribution, so it's a little bit different, and you're going to see where that gets to be important. The gamma distribution. It's a two-parameter family. Well, we had two parameters with the Gaussian, but this is a little bit different, OK? Um, it represents the sum of k exponentially distributed random variables, each of which has a mean. So <coughs> it's k, which tells you the number of, of exponent, exponential populations that are average. And it's called the shape parameter. And uh, we're not going to worry about that name. The chi-squared distribution is the one we're going to be mostly interested in. So we're mostly interested in um, k equals 2, which is this green one. And I think I have a better picture of it. Well, it's going to come up. Anyway, so if you look at this green one, that's the chi-squared distribution. And that's going to work for any time you have a product, square, anything other than an individual value. So when we go to spectra, when we look at time series analysis, look at spectra, we're looking at power. So it's a square of something. And so the PDF that we're going to use for all of the spectral values is chi-squared. Notice chi-squared, unlike the Gaussian, is not symmetrical. Has a steep part and a long slope part. And that's why the confidence intervals we're going to do on spectra 
are going to have a short part and a long part. Okay? <clears throat> so this is the probability density function of... Oh, why did it do that? For the gamma distribution, again, I have no, no comprehension how these guys come up with this. I mean, we're looking at mathematics that was done back in the, you know, <clears throat> 17, 1800s. And they came up with these formulas. So um, this one definitely is skewed because it has, you know, that peak over there. <clears throat> this is my other plot of the... Why does it do that? It's my other plot of the uh, chi-squared function right here. So here... Don't do that. I don't know what I'm... Oh, I see. They're down here. Go away. I'm going to... Oh, there we go. Good. <clears throat> so you can see the main... The first exponential. You can see the chi-squared is the second. You can see then four and so on. Okay, this is a really important theorem. <clears throat> And Gordon Laplace did this. Laplace said, and we mentioned it earlier when we talked about the history, he says it doesn't matter what your original population is. If you take a number of averages from that population, the distribution of the averages will be normally distributed. Is everybody to get that? Doesn't matter, you take a bunch of samples, right? You don't know what that original population is. But it really doesn't matter, because if you're interested in averages, you know the population of the averages is Gaussian. You know that. Anybody ever thought about that? No, I'm sure you haven't. Why is that so important? How do you make measurements today? You don't go out with rulers and measure things. You've got electronic things, right? You hook them all up and you measure things. How do electronic instruments operate? Do they just pull out one number for you? They don't do that. They sample at some hertz, some higher frequency. They're making many samples. Then they average them together. Why do they do that? Why do they do that? Why don't they just give you a number? Why do they average? There would be noise in Noise, and exactly. They want to beat down the noise. Noise is a random variable. <clears throat> noise is, and we're going to talk about errors, so we'll talk about noise. There's this higher probability that their plus is minus. So if you average, they're going to cancel. So those instruments put out an average. So you don't have any idea what the population is to begin with, right? But it doesn't matter because you're working with averages. <clears throat> so this is, I got a couple of demonstrations. If you have a uniform distribution, this is what we're going to start with, a uniform distribution, flat. We integrate once, then we integrate again, you integrate again, integrate again, and integrate again. I think this is the last one. So we've taken 32 from the parent distribution and computed averages. So do you see we've, we've gone from that to that? We now have a nice Gaussian distribution that we can actually deal with. We can actually do something with it. We can use the standard normal table to calculate our confidence interval. We, we, we know something about it. So it's very useful because you didn't know whether or not you knew this first one doesn't matter. Okay, <clears throat> so this is just showing you if you have anything, uh, 
when you when you average it, then it will end up being Gaussian. The other advantage, the standard deviation of the Gaussian that you get out is that standard deviation times this ratio. 1 over the square root of n, n being the number of points in the average that you use to find the new value. Okay? Does anybody see that? So if your thing is operating at so many hertz and you know that, you know, there's 200 points averaged in to give you one value, the standard deviation is the standard deviation of that original population divided by the square root of that 100. So you got a much lower standard deviation than you would have had if you just dealt with the original population. Got it? I mean, it sounds simple, but this is an extremely powerful tool because you don't have to worry about what the population was. You know it's going to be Gaussian. So um, <clears throat> this thing, sigma over the square root of n, is called the standard error. Don't ask me why. Everybody thinks variability should be called errors. I'm not, I'm not too high up on that, but that's what they call it. That's the standard error. So you get a much better distribution. So, and I'm not going to bore you about that, but I want to show you this. This is in the book. What, what we did was we took an, oh, don't do that. We took a whole bunch of distributions here. So here you started with a Gaussian, but by taking averages, so this is parent population n equal 2, n equal 5, n equal 30 n being the number of values averaged into each one of the new values. So makes it much steeper. Uniform population, we just went through that. Triangle, Gaussian, steeper Gaussian. Even a bimodal population, a discrete population, we end up with a Gaussian as well. Here we have an exponential population. We end up with a Gaussian. It's not centered in the middle. It, it has skewness. It's skewed, but it's still a Gaussian population. <coughs> I got a bunch of blank stares. <laughs> there must be some questions out there. No, I did not try to pull anything over on you. This really works. This is, this is something that works with any of your data, no matter what you're doing. If there's averaging going on and all of these electronic instruments do it, you're going to end up with a Gaussian population. You don't think about that, right? But it really makes calculating some of your future numbers really valuable because you don't have to worry about some goofy other population. Whatever the shape of the population distribution, the central limit theorem says we're going to end up with a normal distribution with a reduced standard deviation, reduced by the square root of n. Okay. You guys have questions about that before we go on to the next section? I'm not sure if the silent means you got it or the silent means you ain't got it. <laughs> it's not a trick. I didn't do a trick here. This is for real. This really works. Everybody happy? Uh, yeah. You can say something, you know. <laughs> Surprise, Derek. You surprised me. <laughs> Okay, 
Now go away. Estimation theory. Estimation theory is all we do. Whenever we try to make a measurement, when Derek does his calibrations, they're really estimates. We're trying to get really cl close to a real value, but we're really estimating it. So um, when we try to figure out some answer, here the example given is, oh, I should note that I don't, I don't read all the stuff on these PowerPoints because I think that's really boring. So um, <clears throat> they're there for you to read. They're on D2L, so some people download them and have it in front of them. I don't care what you do with them. They're there. <clears throat> So this example says, you know, radar, you're trying to locate uh, some object here. They have airplanes, and you want to know the distance, and that's really an estimate. Now, I mean, people that do that don't sit there calculating what their estimate is. I mean, you know, <coughs> to them, they make a measurement. So it's assumed that this estimate your information is buried in a noisy signal. There are things going on in what you're doing that, that you didn't really want. There's stuff there that detracts from the information you're trying to derive. So the whole purpose of this estimation theory is to have an estimator and an understanding of the estimator, how good it is in estimating the true value. That's what you really want to know. How, how well did you do? Good's probably the wrong. Should, should say well. I'm, my wife is constantly correcting me on that one. <clears throat> um, so you're, you're going to use, what, what do you have to calculate this uncertainty? It's the same data, right? It's the data you use to get the estimate. You also have to use that data to calculate the uncertainty. That's all you've got. Good estimators, they have expected values that are equal to the true value. It's the unbiased property. They have a relatively small variance. It's called efficiency. And they approach asymptotically the value of the population parameter as the sample size increases. The more data you get, the better your estimate. <clears throat> so, um, here in this, this expression, there's a hat. And, and I'm going to tell you that it, it's not perfect. I don't always have the hats in the right place. I mean, we went crazy when we first wrote this book trying to get this part right. <clears throat> okay. Um, so an, an unbiased estimate, you know, um, has <clears throat> a, bi a bias of zero, of course. And the, S, the expected value would be equal to the, the value, the true value. Um, although this term bias sounds negative, we always think bias is negative. If you're biased, you're sort of against. Everybody thinks, I mean, that's just the way our modern language, English language, has evolved. Bias is negative. And... <clears throat> um, it's not really used that way here. We're not, I mean, there are good biases. I was just talking to, to, to Derek about it. I mean, you know, first of our really successful altimeter satellites was a thing called Topex Poseidon, which was kind of the energizer bunny. It went for a long time beyond its lifetime. And when we put up the replacement, 
And Topex Poseidon had really used a traveling wave tube, basically a tube for its altimeter. And the new one used a solid state altimeter, and we wanted to find out if there was really you know, a difference. And so we flew these things 90 seconds apart for six months, measuring essentially the same thing. And lo and behold, there was a bias. But that's not bad, because we can then adjust all of the future measurements to that, to that bias, with that bias. And then we have a continuous record. So bias is not necessarily bad. You can, you can make use of it. <clears throat> so, yeah. <clears throat> Estimate, well, well, that's right, okay. Estimating the variance. Um, here we know how we calculate the variance. The variance is, that's the formula right there. Except, remember, this is a, what, what can we say about this versus some other formula for the variance? What do you notice about that that's different than what we saw in a different, another formula? Okay, what's the divisor here? What's the denominator? N. Should it be N? N minus 1. N, we said N minus 1 makes it unbiased. So this is a biased estimator. Now, if the sample size was really big, would it matter? No. But if the sample size, you know, if you're getting down there, then it makes a difference. So this is a bias estimator because we had to already calculate a mean. And that took out what we're going to call later a uh, degree of freedom. So um, <clears throat> if, if you then calculate the standard deviation from this, then you're going to find out that you, know, you have a biased standard deviation as well. So the way to get rid of that is, and, and I'm not going to bug you about this concave business, the way to get rid of that is to divide by n minus 1 instead of n. And that corrects for the fact that you you basically lost uh, a degree of freedom. So this thing, which we've now designated as the sample, <clears throat> is the unbiased version of the variance. So this thing is biased, this thing is un unbiased. So this is um, better in the sense that you know that it's closer to the real thing. So we can define a thing called the efficiency. And the efficiency is if we have two unbiased estimates, then we can compute the relative efficiency as the ratio of these two variances. So a low value of efficiency suggests that V2, V of theta 2 is most efficient, while the high value would say theta 1 is more efficient. So <clears throat> um, similarly, if we <clears throat> took the efficiency um, of a normal distribution and <clears throat> we can calculate, oh, uh, this is, all this is doing is giving you a number for it. Um, <clears throat> so another example is sample variances. What this does, do you see what we're doing here? We're taking the biased version and we're subtract, uh, dividing by the unbiased version. So we definitely should get that less than one. <clears throat> okay. Um, so you can consider this, the real theta is also called the population target value. 
the real value, the true value, a lot of different words for the same thing. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what, what's a small b? Small b is um, also, uh, it's a bias, but when we put it in this probability statement. The other, the big B was just the bias when we did the expected value minus the true value. Um, I'm not going to really push that because the book should be consistent, but I will tell you that it may not be so consistent sometimes when <laughs> we slip in the wrong one. We've had, uh, I can't tell you how many errors we've corrected in that book over the years. <clears throat> Okay, so um, this is an important result, but it will really come into play later. So this result is a thing called Chebyshev's theorem, and it says that if you have um, this <coughs> probability statement, that um, <coughs> it really is estimating or, or showing you the estimate of this u in terms of the standard deviation. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to approach talking about confidence intervals. Okay? <clears throat> um, this, so the other way to state it here is that this uh, absolute value of this difference is greater than or equal to um, this k which is <clears throat> this um, parameter relating the standard deviation to the, to the bias, and it's uh, <clears throat> less than this. this. This thing will come, become important later when we're talking about um, <clears throat> using it to estimate sample size. When we're going to talk about sample size, this will come up again. So for right now, the um, <clears throat> thing to remember is that we, we can write probability statements about where our, our estimate should be located, okay? <clears throat> so this thing says um, most random variables occur in nature can be found within two standard deviations of the mean, the probability of 0.75. Okay, so that's, remember, you know, it was 68 point something percent is within two standard deviations. <clears throat> um, that's, that's assuming that most random variables that occur in nature, oh gosh, are um, <clears throat> actually Gaussian distributed. <coughs> okay, so we're trying to get to a way of saying how confident we are that we know the right value. And that's the confidence interval. So the confidence interval is a range of values which is likely to include the unknown population parameter. Okay? So we're going to use our data to tell us not only the estimator, but how well we've done finding the real population value. Okay? Does everybody get that? I mean, most, a lot, you read a lot of papers, a lot of things that you're going to do in your research, you'll find that people don't do confidence intervals. But then, if you don't do it, how do you know that there's something you can trust? Like I said, we've probably gotten more inquiries about confidence intervals than anything else regarding this book. People have realized that this is something that you can do to say, hey, I've done, I've done this well at, at calculating what I want to calculate. Now, there's a huge concept in here 
That's going to be very important later. Independent samples. What's an independent sample? What is it? What does that? What what does statistical independence mean? What does it mean? Just uh, a fancy word. Samples, yeah. Samples what? don't rely on one another. They don't rely on one another. Now, is that strictly going to be the case? You have a bunch of numbers. You take one out. Is the next one totally independent? Why not? You change the population. But mostly things can be independent. I mean, you know, that's, if it was a big sample, that's probably very subtle. You couldn't really tell. Independent samples, the whole concept is really important because the statistics depend on them being independent. If they're dependent, if, if any sample is basically the same thing, you really aren't getting more samples. You've got one sample, that's all you've got. So independence really turns out to be really important. Confidence intervals, okay. This is where it really gets tricky. Oh my gosh, we don't have much time. When you calculate a confidence interval, there's a very subjective part of it. It's called the significance level. The significance level is something you have to decide. You have to decide, do I want to be 99% sure? Do I want to be 90% sure? 95% sure? What about 80% sure? Now, what's going to happen if I go to a lower number in my significance, what does my confidence interval do? Does it get bigger? Does it get smaller? Get smaller. So when you're less confident, the confidence interval gets smaller. Looks really good, right? So you publish this paper, so look at this tiny confidence interval I got but I'm only 80% sure that works. If you're 95%, it's going to get okay, bigger. 99% going to be even bigger. So there's real gamesmanship in here. You have to decide. Nobody else is going to tell you what. There's no you know, written formula about choosing it. Although, if something other than 95 or 90 or 99 percent, you already should set off a red flag. <clears throat> you see 80 percent, you know, to say, this guy's cheating. <clears throat> so that's very important to realize because you need, you need to be able to pick that. Um, we're not going to talk about hypothesis testing and confidence intervals right now because we haven't talked about hypothesis testing. So the confidence interval is written like this, okay? So probability, that's the big P. You have a low and a high and the real parameter, the theta, in between, and it's equal to one minus alpha. So Alpha is actually the thing that you're going to choose. So if you choose a 95%, alpha becomes a 0.05. Don't, why do they do it that way? I don't know. That's the way the tables are written, you know, and you have to pick. So what do you really need to know to do this? Well, you have to pick this significance level which is 1 minus alpha times 100. And you then have to go in for your, <clears throat> your degrees of freedom your, into that uh, standard normal table, and you'll pick out parameters. And I'm not going to have, you're going to have to do this, Derek. So Derek will come back next time, and I would suggest 
starting starting right here and because this is a really really important because you're going to get to a formula that looks uh, like this this is the formula for getting the the interval so the theta hat are the estimates estimates that you got out of the data the z alpha over 2 times sigma theta those are what you got out of the standard normal table and the theta is the thing you're trying to estimate so you're going to get a low and a high value and it's going to be between those two and you're going to pick the significance level here okay so that's going to be your 95 or your 99 percent that level and so that's going to be your confidence interval that's going to tell you how close you got to the real value even though you don't know the real value you know how close you are to it okay so Derek's going to be here on Wednesday and I will be moaning <laughs> my wife says I'm a big baby so <laughs> I'm about to be a big baby <laughs> So, starting on Wednesday, you can start on the homework. And if you have problems, you can email me and or Derek. And uh, for the first little while, well, for probably a couple of weeks, I'm going to be a one-hand typist. So, don't expect a really rapid response. <laughs>